Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to another Mustard Seed message. My name is Sean, and I pray that you are abundantly blessed in everything that you do today, that you'll feel the presence of God in your heart. And as you are partaking in this message, we pray as the Word of God is spoken, that it will take effect in your life in real and profound ways. Also, uh, I want to ask you if you could like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Uh, that would just prove to spread this message even farther and farther as we push forward in our ministry at the Mustard Seed. Let's worship God, and I will see you very soon to read the scripture and get right into it with you.
Welcome back. 1979, the peak of the Cold War between Russia and the United States. War could break out at any moment. NORAD, the Pentagon, the United States Air Force, their systems start blotting red dots all over the country of the United States. And they're showing a nuclear attack from Russia. It's as if Russia is throwing every single bit of the nuclear arsenal that they have right at the continental of North America. and. It's on. Here is the nightmare scenario being lived out. World War III is about to happen. The United States is calling all of their men to arms. They're manning their airships. They're, they're, they're preparing the rockets to start firing nuclear weapons right back at Russia. Instead of just depending on their nuclear detection system, they go to the real-life satellites and try to confirm what's actually happening on the ground. And the answer is absolutely nothing. What had happened was a person from NORAD had inserted a Russian simulation for training purposes and it leaked into the, the, into the system and started to go off on every single computer that was connected into that system. World War III averted, but almost came to a thunderous start, all based on a misunderstanding. It's very difficult to navigate around life without any misunderstandings, right? Guy, how you doing? Girl fine guy great and we wonder why there's so much tension in that relationship and and the guy just thinks it's fantastic that the girl always lets the guy go out and spend all night with his friends misunderstandings can have serious consequences in life And as we ponder on that truth, we think of God and, and we think of the very first part of Hebrews and one of the most underrated things spoken about in the Bible, which just simply says, God speaks. And because God speaks to us, have we considered the gravity 
that we have the literal word of God available to us, that we can hear God's voice, but also how absolutely necessary it is for us to tune into the correct frequency and not have any misunderstandings when it comes to God and what he's saying to us. Friends, right away what we can say is that Jesus Christ is the Word of God made flesh. Jesus is the exact imprint of God in heaven. Jesus is the divine utterance that God speaks. Jesus is God speaking. It, Jesus is the message. Jesus is the truth. Jesus, if we, if we do not want to misunderstand God, then we go straight to Jesus to know what exactly God is saying. And what is God saying through Jesus? Well, let's crack open the book of Hebrews in chapter 8 and get right into it. Let's receive the word of God and listen and not misunderstand, but, but hear his voice and understand exactly what he's saying with no misunderstanding. So here we go. Chapter 8. Starting in verse 6. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So, what this is saying right away is that Jesus is better than the old ways. Jesus has better promises than what was. And we praise God every single day that we do not need to follow the old Levitical law. That 613 thou shalt and must measure ups to. No, not any longer that we don't have to do that thou shalt thing. In verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. And now the author of Hebrews starts quoting a prophecy in the book of Jeremiah, prophesying of what things will come through the manifestation of Jesus Christ in verse 8. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful towards their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what it becomes obsolete and growing old is, re and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. How do we not misunderstand what God is saying? I believe that this 
chapter 9 holds some keys to answering that question and how to get into the Lord and hear Him clearly. And what we're going to go through today is three different ways to not misunderstand God. Beginning with the first. And we're going to go right to the chap- uh, chapter 8 or chapter 9. We're going to go right to chapter 8 and go to verses 4 and 5. Now, if he, Jesus, were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown on the mountain. Now, how is this helping us to not misunderstand God? Okay, so there's two words that are used in those verses that are very important. The first being a copy. And when a copy what, what this is saying about the Old Testament being a copy is that it, it's not a, an exact representative of the thing, but it, it's pointing to the truth. What do I mean by this? If I were to draw a portrait of you, it would probably be like a stick man figure. I'm not that good at drawing. But if I were to draw a portrait of you, the portrait would not be you. But it would be pointing to you. It would be representing you. It would be resembling you. But the thing that is greater is you. And in the same way as the Old Testament speaks, it is a copy of the things of heaven, pointing to the heavenly things, representing the heavenly things, but not being heavenly in themselves, but just a ritual or, or something that is resembling. In another way of saying this, the verses say, the second word is shadow. And so the shadow of something resembles that thing, but it's just a dim outline. It does not have texture. It does not have depth. It does not have color. It only reveals that there is something better, something deeper, something more profound that the shadow is from. In the same way, the Old Testament is only just a shadow of the heavenly things. And an example of what the book of Hebrews uses to give illustration to this point is the tent, which is meaning the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was was given to Moses to build in exact instructions. He needed to do it to the exact detail. The reason why it needed to be to spec was that it was representing something in heaven. So it needed to be done exactly according to the instructions given to by God. So the tent in and of itself was representing a kingly household as Israel was wandering through the desert. This is where the king would rest. That's what it represented. And so God is our king, is the heavenly symbol. Even more so, so this tent, the entrance would always be facing to the east and it would be guarded by a cherubim statue. And what that was representing was the Garden of Eden. It was showing the Garden of Eden. And as you go into the tent, the lampstand would represent the tree of life. The law would represent the tree of knowledge. The gold that was embroidered in the tent was representing the heavenly things. So this 
physical reality that was the tabernacle was a shadow and a copy of the things that are heavenly. It was a metaphor, friends. God uses earthly things that we can understand in order to illustrate heavenly things that we don't understand. Another example of this is verse 9. Verse 9 says, Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on that day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Now, does God have a hand? Yeah, probably, I guess, maybe, if he wanted to have a hand. How big is it? Is it the hand that holds the world? Or is it the hand that holds our heart? It's big or is it small? I don't know. Is that even the point of this verse? Did Israel only feel God in their hands as God guided them by the hand? Well, no, that's not the point. He's using the earthly thing that we can understand, which is our hands, to reveal a heavenly principle that we, that we now can understand through this earthly metaphor. He's guiding us out of slavery. And that's the heavenly principle. God guides us. And so as we understand God, we are meant to understand him through metaphor. We're not meant to misunderstand him by relating to him through physical and earthly things. Friends, in the same way that tabernacle is no longer meant to be the place where we worship. It's no longer meant to be the, this physical thing that we hold in high esteem. It was only meant to point to the real deal, the heavenly things. And so we don't get caught in ritualistic practices. We don't get caught in physical uh, icons that we worship. We don't build statues and idols and all of these sorts of things. So we don't misunderstand God in that way. So the first thing to not misunderstand God, to the tool that this scripture is teaching us to not misunderstand God, is that God uses metaphor. Now, the second thing we can see is that the Old Testament has been made obsolete. In verse 13, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So the the law, the law, is obsolete. The thou shalt, the not good enough, the you don't measure up, the you need to try harder, is obsolete. And this Greek word, the, the, the fullness of it is really this idea of wearing out. It's been worn out. It's tired. It's gone. In the same way those dial phones, remember the... the you crank the the dial and it goes it goes back when you hit 9 it like took literally like 10 12 seconds to get back and you'd have to dial each single phone number like each single digit like that it's worn out it's tired it's gone it's it's obsolete we no longer need to live under the thou shalt in the moment that we sense that God is leading us down that you need to try harder road, what we can immediately relate to is that is just a complete misunderstanding of the way to hear God's voice. What this scripture in verse 13 says is that Jesus has made it new. And, and the word, the fullness of it in the Greek is this reinvigoration. This reigniting, this renewing, like a summer rain on a hot day as the 
water hits us, it refreshes us. Like baptism, dunking someone as they come out of the water, that freshness of the soul, renewing. That's how we can hear God's voice if our soul is reinvigorated and alive. God writes his law on our hearts. It's no longer about that you're not good enough. It's I will make you new. I will reinvigorate you. So that's the second way that we don't misunderstand God is that he is not a God of thou shalt. He's a God of making new. He creates in you a new person that automatically goes and does the thing that he desires you to do. And finally, the third thing that we are being called to understand, to not misunderstand God, is found in verse 10 and 11, which says, For this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. They shall all know the Lord from the least to the greatest. What this means is that you don't get a gold star for effort in the kingdom of God. We don't hear God's voice more clearly by trying harder. It is not a merit-based system to hear God's voice. And if it is in our lives, then we are having a dramatic misunderstanding on how to hear God. The least to the greatest, the most accomplished, the tryhards to those who are humble and, and weak. We can see it's not about learning more and being better. The apostles were seen as the unlearned and people were amazed at the things that they had known. Why? Because they had received revelation from God. And in order to receive revelation is to understand the definition of revelation, which is quite simply to be revealed to. Like the physical world peeled away like a scroll and were able to see into the spirit. That's revelation. And we cannot do this with our own doing. We need God to reveal himself to us. We do not create him in his, in, we do not create him in our image. He creates us in his image. He defines himself for who he is and we do not. We do not find God in our own muscles, in our own merit. As we look at the book of Revelation, one can see that it is the spiritual that we're gazing upon. In the same way, that's the revelation that we need in order to see God. We need God to show it to us. And so we don't misunderstand God by, by trying in our own human efforts. And friends, that's how we can hear God's voice clearly. Number one, understanding that he uses the earthly things to reveal the heavenly things. He uses what we can understand to reveal the heavenlies through metaphor. We don't understand him through the earthly things, but we understand what he's trying to illustrate through the earthly things. Number one. Number two, we receive God's word and hear him clearly through the spirit of God refreshing us and renewing us. Not through the thou shalt and not good enoughs. As soon as we feel any sense of shame or guilt or needing to just put in 
more and, 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 and work harder like a Pharisee, we know that's not God. And finally, God is not working on a merit-based system. He does not give you any gold stars for how good of a uh, try-hard you are. But he reveals himself through his, his spirit. He reveals himself through himself. Not by our own learnedness. In the mighty name of Jesus, we move forward in hearing God. In Jesus' name, amen.